Hi, I'm Sheila James Kuehl, your host. Welcome to Get Used To It, a uh, little uh, award-winning cable show dealing with issues that are of interest to the lesbian, gay, bisexual community and probably all the rest of you out there as well. Uh, today we have a uh, somewhat unusual show. There's been a lot of talk over the past several years about values and ethics and morals. Uh, a lot of talk in political races, but really I think a lot of talk in living rooms around the country as well as we reassess and discuss. And in our community, we have noticed there's been a lot of talk about values and ethics and morals about our community, but we haven't seen very much on the air where real live members of our community get to talk about our own ethics and values and morals. So today, Get Used To It is going to step right into the middle of that with three wonderful guests. Uh, my first guest, Phil Wilson, co-founder of the Black Gay and Lesbian Leadership Forum and former director of public policy at AIDS Project Los Angeles. Welcome, Phil. My next guest, Rabbi Denise Egger, who is the spiritual leader of Congregation Kol Ami, which is West Hollywood's reform synagogue that does uh, outreach to gay and lesbian and bisexual people as well as their straight friends and family. He does a good job of it. <laughs> Welcome, Denise. Okay. And finally, delighted to introduce my third guest, uh, Professor Robert Davidoff, who is a professor and program chair of the history department at the Claremont Graduate School and is also co-author with Michael Nava of Created Equal, Why Gay Rights Matter to America. Welcome, Robert. Thank you. Well, let me start with you, Robert. This is a an issue we haven't, uh, you know, we haven't set a whole sort of structured way of talking about values and ethics and morals. Even in our community, uh, we'll probably notice that we uh, don't always agree on uh, what those are. But my premise for the show really is that through the course of our own individual history as mm -hmm. a community, uh, it's sort of in the shadows, coming out of the shadows, into the light, whatever you want to say, we, we've learned some collective lessons, and we have or do express some collective, at times, values maybe different from the so-called mainstream. I want to test with you whether you think that's the case. If so, what might some of them be? Do we now have something we can share, now that we're kind of in the middle of the griddle, as we say, share with the country something to teach them? I think we do. Uh, I love the way you put that. Um, I think the first thing that we all notice is that the values question as it's raised in our society seems to be between people who have notions of what values should be and they're worried about how to impose them. And then I think there are actually the majority of people whose struggle is to transform the, the values that come from their own experience into ways of conducting themselves. And I think the lesbian and gay communities are exceptionally important in this because in order, as you say, to come out, uh, the first thing you have to do is consult your inner truth. Uh, I'm a history professor, so I also you know, have to say Ralph Waldo Emerson here, <laughs> but it's true that, that what we bring to the table of discussion is the experience that democracy requires, which is an authentic experience of self that then becomes a road to issues of value. Um, it seems to me there are a couple that we have the choice to adopt. And I think the word choice is important because choice is always used against us. But in fact, I think our experience as lesbians and gays gives us a choice to learn from our own histories in ways that perhaps is more pressing than for other people. After all, we're unique in that we don't have parents well, now more and more we do, but it, certainly for most of us, we didn't have parents sitting us down and saying, these are the moral precepts, this is how you should live your life. Instead, we had to take seriously what the society said and learn to choose between the part of the society that said, be real, be true to yourself, start with yourself and try and treat others that way, or those placards that said, don't you dare be you. Um, I guess two values in particular strike me. Uh, and, and one of them is this learning to, to live from experience and to think about values in terms of your own experience. And the second one, I think, comes from the whole um, AIDS experience that we've had. And that is that we have to take the categories of friendship and love 
to the end more seriously. We've had to become activists. And also, I think, on both spheres, gays and lesbians have had to become very suspicious and critical about experts. Hmm. And you know, the society is run by people who say they're experts, but anyone who has uh, been involved, for example, with someone with AIDS knows just how limited the expert advice of a doctor is. And so I guess I would say that the supreme value that I think we have to offer up to a society like our own now is the tough but rewarding value of taking your own experience seriously and trying to reason from that. But you know, the, uh, the right wing has called that secular humanism, in a way. Mm -hmm. That is, um, if I learn from my own experience what my core values should be, then am I not deviating enormously from the history of you know, man and womankind where values and ethics and morals, especially morals, have been sort of handed down from the mountain, as it were, and we are not to question them and we are not to learn from our own experience. Our own experience can oftentimes lead us to sin or astray or whatever. Um, Though I agree with you, the authenticity of that experience is exactly what we've learned to share. If I may, I have two responses to that. The first is that I rather like being called a secular humanist. It's <laughs> one of the nicer things I've ever been called. And I, I think there is a division about that, and I don't think one should pretend to be on, um, you know, if you are a secular humanist, that's fine. But I think the key point you raise is exactly right. The, there is a vision of certain people that morality is about claiming the same things that everybody has always had handed down to them. Now, my own experience, limited experience in religion and fairly wide reading suggests to me that most religious figures, their entire lives are about making the values that they are given authentic in their lives. And I think that's true of every religious tradition I've ever encountered. So kind of an overlay doesn't feel right to me, doesn't comport with what I know from my experience, but it must be right because I've been told it and I try to make it work. Kind of like a gay person trying to live in a straight world exactly. and thinking that there's something that's, wrong with how we are. That's why I really do believe that the gen general shared experience of the lesbian and gay person struggling with an identity, having to come out, is the model for moral struggle. Well, there's some aspect of truth then in what you're saying. I mean, sort of truth as a value. I know that um, there have been some families that have said to me that when their son or daughter came out, that was not the end of, fortunately or unfortunately, family secrets that begin to yes. be told and frankly just brought to light and, and talked about. And that though it's painful, just like coming out is painful, that there's something that's better at the end, having said that which was a great secret, um, hiding yourself from someone else or hiding exactly. you know, something that happened. That's exactly, I know in my own family, mine was the first secret to come out, or I was the first one to come out with a secret, but the, the structure of family secrets has crumbled. Um, I, I I'm had an experience, I'm sure many people watching uh, also saw the hearings on Justice Thomas and, and Anita Hill's testimony, when she said, in answer to a senator's question, uh, essentially that, uh, yes, she followed the person who had abused her to a new position. I was sitting at home saying, yeah, of course, that's what it means for me or for various other people to be in abusive situations. And I really believe sometimes that the country is divided between the majority of its citizens who know what it is to experience frustration and to feel compelled to follow that which is not for them. And I think very often the people, with some exceptions, who run our public life are people who have a stake in not admitting it. So I agree with you about honesty, but I also think it's why the gay and lesbian, secular humanist or not secular humanist values cause us to have a critical perspective on how the society works. And I have yet to read uh, a, a religious figure, uh, a morally serious philosopher, who did not say that the core of human experience is not professing values, but struggling to activate and realize them. Do you agree, Denise? Oh, I absolutely agree. I think that 
you know, it's nice to have values and morals and ethics that hang out in, in the intellectual re realm, but unless those values are translated and lived in everyday life, and uh, the ethics that call out to us to lead our lives and, and create uh, sometimes barriers, protective barriers to keep out the pain, and sometimes, you know, the barriers to keep ourselves safe, um, we all have those, but those ethical boundaries in our lives, if you don't live them, then what good are they? And then it's just a nice, interesting head game that we play with one another. So having a congregation within an ancient religious tradition, um, uh, somewhat rigid, although I think uh, various aspects and shades now mm -hmm. uh, within the various uh, congregations, is there something different in our community and the lessons that we learn and the ways we interact with, uh, with the traditional religious values? Uh, I think so. I, th I, th I want to say first that many people within our gay and lesbian community have been greatly wounded by religion um, because so much of it is hierarchical and patriarchal in its formation that again says you must follow X and if you do not do X then you are a sinner and you're out of the fold. Um, and many people have been wounded by that and so they kind of sometimes throw out everything in our gay and lesbian community, rather than taking a serious intellectual, emotional look at what values and ethics, what progressive traditions, and I'm not just talking about Western traditions, I'm talking about all kinds of religious structured belief systems and disciplines have to say that are authentic and that we do live. For me personally, you know, Judaism is, is one of the older religions and certainly was patriarchal and hierarchical and still is in some of its forms. On the other hand, I find a home in a very progressive and liberal tradition which fully embraces lesbian and gay personhood uh, from the equality of ordination <laughs> to endorsing our civil rights to be married if we so choose. There's room for my experience as a lesbian within the realm of full experiences. And I think it's very Jewish because I was hearing the two of you talk earlier. Um, there's a Jewish story about being at Mount Sinai. It wasn't just Moses coming down and handing the so-called law to the people, but before that happened, the Holy One of Blessings voice rang out with the words and everybody who was present at Mount Sinai experienced for herself or for himself that voice and our tradition, my tradition teaches that some hear it with a loud booming thunder and others feel it uh, and others hear it as music and others sense it uh, as the small quiet voice within to quote Isaiah so that that allows, within my tradition, for a variety of experience to be authenticated, including our lesbian and gay experience as valid, as moral, as, as you say, Robert, our inner true selves speaking forth. And I think uh, I, I'm very lucky because I have a tradition and a history that also includes a moral system and values and ethics that has a home and a place for my voice to stand in concert with many other voices that allows me to do that. Um, for lesbian and gay folk who, don't, who aren't as lucky as I am, I think that we, st we have to really struggle with the issue of honesty. And in, as Robert says, in a democracy, honesty is supposed to be a paramount value. Um, we see that value violated constantly wherever we go. Uh, and the message really becomes don't be honest, don't be truthful to protect yourself or to save yourself or to keep this so-called family safe. And, and yet when we are truthful about our experience as lesbian and gay bisexual people, when we are true to our inner core and honest, um, that birthing, that freedom demands uh, a response in others who are hiding whether they're hiding about their sexual orientation or there's those family secrets which, which can't be told because the family will fall apart if Papa, Grandpapa knows what really went on with his son's gambling habit. It has nothing to do with sexual orientation. Oh, but and they say, it'll kill him. Don't tell don't him. Don't tell him. It'll <laughs> kill him. Right. I mean, that was the heaviest thing. Don't right. tell your mother. It'll kill her. But and you think it's like, don't step on a crack, you know, in the sidewalk. 
because you could cause this. And yet, I think our lives, whoever we are, beyond sexual orientation, if that's possible, has to deal first with honesty. Because from my perspective as a rabbi, that's what the Eternal called me to be, was honest, to know before whom I'm with, who I'm in partnership with. But this would not be unique to our community. I mean, what you're saying, it seems to me, is um, a value to anyone called to uh, you know, a tradition where they need to uh, or want to sort of grapple with personal identity. And maybe sexual identity would be one portion of that. Right. But is there a unique set of hmm. values? And I, I know we, don't, we won't say every single person in our community feels the same way about right. this. But do you sense something? I mean, your congregation is primarily lesbian and gay, and I know you've been in the tradition long enough, you've been in congregations that are not. Do, have we had, either out of our own oppression, or I don't know what, have we had to learn something that we now express in a, in a different way or know in a different way? Well, I think that because of our, our oppression, our self-oppression, our lessons that we have to continually learn in self-esteem, uh, that to value ourselves, to value our truth as true, as real, as lived, um, that we've had to learn that lesson so much that it, that this is a gift we've been able to then to bring to other communities where it hasn't been as articulated. It may be present, but I think a gay, the gay lesbian experience has really given permission, if you will, for other traditions to explore this in a new way. I think the AIDS crisis in particular has forced us as a community to respond in ways when certainly in the beginning no one else would respond. And so I would think that within our gay lesbian experience and our brief you know, modern history in these few uh, decades as an organized community per se, uh, we've learned that compassion is a value um, that we must live. And we must live that value to help others die peacefully as well as to keep our community alive. Phil, that's a community you have been have spent a lot of time in, done a lot of work in APLA and also for the city of LA. And um, I know that you've probably done a lot of thinking about this. I mean, you and I have had conversations about this. What do you think? Well, you know, one of the, one of the questions you asked that struck me was, you know, are there values that are unique to our community? I don't know if there are values that are unique to our communities. I think that out of our experience, there have been manifestations. Now, and those manifestations of those values are unique. Now, and, 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 and if you will, I'm reminded of kind of um, pottery now, and how some things are um, counterintuitive. And you know, when you, you make pottery out of clay and, and you put it into a kiln and you fire it, now, now intuitively you would think that if you put clay under this heat, the clay would melt, it would burn up. But that's not what happens. What happens is it gets hard. You know, and, 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 and it actually passed the test of the fire. And I would say that that's one of the things that's happened to our community, particularly in the face of AIDS. You know, that we have learned ethics you know, and values uh, in the kiln. You know, and you know, then the words that echo in my ear are the, er, the words of honesty and truth. You know, and, and I would add to that you know, the issues around compassion uh, and courage. Now, particularly in the HIV arena. The thing that I find really peculiar in this discussion, particularly the public discourse on value, is this kind of notion of family values. And you and I have talked about family values a lot, and you know a little about, a lot actually, about my background. And, you know, and, the, and the thing about that for me really goes back to this issue of choice. Now, in that, I really think that there are very few people who know as much about family values as gays and lesbians. Because we take those values seriously. Now, when we bond, we do it without the protection of tradition, and without the protection of religion, and without the protection of civil law. Now, and so when we bond, now those values for many of us are values that, that we take on in a very real way. And in our most recent past, you, know, you definitely take on those values as much for the um, 
the, you know, the, 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 the sickness of it, or the death of it, or the, the, ba the, the sadness of it, an understanding of that. Now, particularly for gay men, now, when, when, when we make a commitment to each other, that even if we know that we're b both of the partners are HIV negative, now, there is this thing in there that understands that this commitment has to withstand the test of the fire. You know, and so the values connected with family, I think, really speak to kind of the values that we've learned through, through this experience. Mm -hmm. On the notion of compassion, I think that for any people who has kind of weathered the type of oppression you know, that gays and lesbians have weathered, you, know, uh, you have to come out of that understanding what compassion is really about. And when you add on top of that the, the layer of the overwhelming grief and bereavement that we've experienced connected with HIV and AIDS, and quite frankly, now although it's not you know, talked about enough, you know, the issues around breast cancer and cervi cervical cancer among lesbian women, you know, that, that we understand compassion, we understand what it means to take care of someone, to say to someone who's a family member, whether or not it's a chosen family or a birth family, I'm going to be there. And to know that you better mean it. Because it's not just words, because there's a very high likelihood that you'll be tested in, in that regard. I think that's what Robert was referring to when he said, you said activist, but I think you didn't mean political activist so much as you must be an active friend. I mean, in our community, <laughs> you know, God forbid, you should say to someone, I'm your friend, because you have made a commitment, kind of, in the community. We show up at each other's hospital beds. We show up at each other's you know, we have our own rituals because we've been so closed away from sort of the traditional rituals. We aren't allowed to get married. Um, we don't really, aren't, we're not welcome in the church for our children to be, you know, baptized or whatever. And so we create ritual, we create sort of community. Um, you also said to me that our own personal stuff becomes our cultural stuff. Um, the compassion that we, you know, that we exchange. It's become sort of the value in the larger community, in our community. Like, we have to be there for each other. Is that, is that what you meant? Oh, I, I think it's, it's what I meant, but it's more elaborated than what I said at the time, so I'd like to claim credit for it and extend it <laughs> even more. <laughs> One of the things that I, I think is an example. You come out, whether young or old, and you need a wise old queen. You need someone. Well, I was lucky, um, although I was the age of a wise old queen, I had other queens, all younger than I, just for the record, <laughs> who taught me things. And one of the things that they really taught me was how to be a friend. It wasn't that I hadn't been a friend before, but so much of my friendship was in a professional or a heterosexual context and involved stopping short of what I really needed which was full contact, not so much sexual as human. Yeah, right. um, m I, I think, Phil, what you said was inspiring to me uh, because I think one of the challenges of being there is to touch, to be touched. Uh, and, and I think that the reason that's activism is that activism to me means a commitment to changing things within the scope of your own action. And I know that it's a bit of a stretch to say that dishing is activism, <laughs> but frankly, I think it is. When, um, when we sit around and watch the old homo classics uh, or read the extraordinary new lesbian and gay literature, it seems to me that our conversation is not merely highfalutin book chat, although I'd love to do that, but it's really a ritual of communication. Is this true? Is it wrong? I can't believe she wrote that. You know, it's, it's about the labor inflection. of creating community. Yeah. You know, and, I, and I think that that is something that very few um, people experience today. Many of, many of us in, in, in our other uh, cultural experiences now are about established communities. 
you know, that, w that we understand what it is to be about that. Now, and one of the things that's unique about the gay and lesbian experience, and I think I've even said this on, on, on this show, is that we're the only people, uh, actually I don't feel this so much anymore, but I'll use the quote anyway, because it'll make a point, <laughs> that, 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 that we're the only people born in the, See, in, in, right, that we're the only people born in the enemy's camp. You know, that you know, I learned to be black because I had parents who were black, you know. You know men learn to be men you know, because they're men in their lives. Women learn to be women you know, because they're women in their lives. The, the notion of a gay and lesbian community, you know, a cultural community, you know, is, is an experience that we all participate in. You know? And to that degree that you invest a certain amount of passion in that. Now, and a certain amount of attentiveness uh, to that experience. Uh, Sheila, I like to think of, uh, of it as having gay spiritual parents, not just mentors, who really teach us about who we are as lesbian and gay people. And whether the relationships to the outside world, to our biological birth families, to, uh, are, are good or bad, at least we have the shared, handed down tradition and handed down wisdoms uh, of those people for whom when we came out or as we are coming out, help to introduce us to the way the or communities organized, and it doesn't matter whether it was in the late 60s and how it was organized, or now, or how it might be in future years, um, but to find yourselves almost, to acquire for yourselves uh, spiritual teachers uh, that can introduce you to kind of that larger gay and lesbian uh, moral system. And kind of like having a home to go home to. Yes. I mean, we've been homesick for places we've never been. <laughs> oh, yes. Right. <laughs> Not yes. my line, but I don't remember yes. whose it was. <laughs> yes. But, you know, um, Robert brought up something that I think we really need to talk about. This community is defined by um, people who hate us as being totally about sex. That's, and that means immoral because the whole, it seems to me, in the religious tradition, it, one of the most... Um, powerful ways to control people throughout the centuries has been to control what they do about procreation and sex, not necessarily in that order. <laughs> and so we are scapegoated enormously because not only is that what they see us doing differently, but it's about something that is really icky and, you know, and that uh, this sex phobic culture in America, this puritanical culture, hasn't wanted to deal with. We have dealt with it, and it has been a real point of contention, actually, between the men's and women's communities in the old days, mm -hmm. and maybe still a little bit. The question of a sexual ethic. Is there such a thing as a sexual ethic in our community? Because when you talk about welcome right. spiritual parents, come into the yes. community, the, the people who hate us out there say, yeah, that's recruiting. You know, they're recruiting, and what right. they mean by recruiting is not somebody to go down to the center and stuff envelopes. They mean recruiting sexually. Well, so we're supposed to be immoral. Well, you know, I think that for our community, there are two parts to that question. One is that the truth of the matter is all human beings are sexual. There's a sexual component to our lives. And what, what, what we represent to, to many people who attack this community is we, we represent a place where people talk about it. Mm -hmm. know, where, where there's an honesty about it, you know, and, and I, I think that's intimidating for people because as long as your sexuality is defined and controlled by someone else, whoever that someone else is has a power over you, you know, and once you, you break that kind of bond, there's kind of a freedom, you know, a liberation that happens uh, that makes some folks uncomfortable. The second part of it is, quite frankly, it's very cynical because if you can define any people by a thing, you know, rather than accept their total humanity, then you have, a, you have the ability to do wedge politics and divide folks one among and another. And also do better and worse. Absolutely. And, and also and to dehumanize. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you objectify them. Absolutely. Yes, it may be worth reminding everyone that the sexual libel has been characteristic of uh, r racism, mm -hmm. anti-Semitism, yes. and it's, it's, it's so specific that the very horror of it is almost funny because you can take the texts that were used to defame African Americans, to All defame Jews. All black men are rapists. 
and right. it just fits right into it. I think one of the differences, though, for us is it is true that we are a community whose sexual minority status defines a great deal of our experience. And so I think that our process of having, in a sense, to embrace without being distracted by attack, having to embrace the search for love, pardon me, um, and for sex, mm -hmm. and um, you know, in a good life, maybe even both, but that, that, in fact, the tough thing is that we are being attacked for something that we dare not let go of. Um, because, in fact, the, the sex phobics, half the time what they're talking about is against talking about having sex, about accepting your desires. And one specific thing I'd like to suggest, it is characteristic of, the, of marriage, in the, at least in American history, that the facade of a happy husband and wife bond that then is a parental bond, etc. It is commonplace that the man characteristically strays. And the society is organized for that. Now it seems to me we are in the position of taking the practice of most human societies and refusing to claim that what's happening isn't happening. To say that there is much greater moral risk to lie about what people do than to face it and cope with it. And I think that's, I think it's why even when we're attacked, we really dare not give up our att attachment to sexuality. But the women's community was, at least in the past, very critical of the kind of freewheeling um, sexual practices that they were told about, at least, mm -hmm. in the men's community, uh, mostly pre-AIDS. Um, and that I have also heard men say that they were glad that there was a movement toward more commitment at the same time as the women's community was beginning to emulate the men's community and try to lighten up a little bit, you know, and not, you know, the joke about uh, what does a lesbian bring on a second date? A U-Haul. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move in. Some, a friend of mine said, God forbid we should get marriage in this country for gays and lesbians because lesbians would get married on the second date no matter what <laughs> and move in. But so there began to be a little bit of em sort of embracing uh, toward the middle ground. But there was some criticism of the, of the behavior of the men's community. And I don't know whether there's an ethical value in there as well. Well, you know, when I came out, and um, he, actually it's funny, you talk about the second date, and you know, I, I ended up being in a 10-year relationship with you know, the very first person I met. Uh, so <laughs> I, maybe that's not a gender <laughs> issue yeah, or not. not. <laughs> but, but, you know, one of the things about that that I think worked was a commitment to be present. You know, and, and one of the things that can happen, not always, but can happen or, or did, could, could happen and did happen sometimes in the, 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 the male community was really um, kind of an understanding of the, the, the different or the diversity of expression. You know, that, that there, there are times when people would connect with each other for, for, for reasons of permanency. You know? And there are times when people would connect to each other in, in temporary fashion. You know? And finding ways to negotiate that and to understand that and to tell the truth about that was a challenge and people didn't always succeed in, 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 that, in that regard. And I think that that is a part of the, di the difference between the way men and women are socialized. I think that what has evolved over the last 10 years in particular is that you know, gay men are beginning to say, you know, I need to find out who I am and work out with who my partner is, what works for us. Forget all of the rules, you know, that we have to create a unit here that works for us. Now it has to be, the foundation of that unit has to be these two individuals. And I think women, lesbians, are, came to that same place. No, and that, the, that, that model really didn't work. And I used, I used to say that lesbians did serial monogamy, you know, uh, and that, you know, I don't know what gay men did, but that lesbians <laughs> did serial monogamy. And I find that the women that are in my life, you know, are, are, are in fact having those same kinds of negotiations where they're saying, well, who are you? 
You know, and who am I? And, and what are we going to do with this attraction that we have for each other? And what values do we share in common? Absolutely. Because the whole, I think one of the things that's missing in this conversation, and I think is totally missed by the sex phobic, by uh, those that still hang on to Victorian era uh, ideals about sex and sexuality and gender role stereotyping, is that this isn't about sex, really. Sex may be the expression it takes. It's about seeking intimacy. Mm -hmm. And sex is one way we build intimacy, but not the only way. Couples, families, you extend the unit. Friendship circles build intimacy. And so in our search as a people, gay and lesbian people, to find out the truth of ourselves, um, we may have experienced different models in that search for intimacy and friendships and family and partnership as lesbians and gay men differently because we were raised with gender role stereotypes. And it, from, from my sense of at least history, Professor, you'll forgive me. Um, you know is, I won't. <laughs> is that, you know, it wasn't just about f the sexual revolution and uh, open open sexual behaviors for gay men. It's also about rejecting the stereotype of masculinity that demanded to be responsible only to X, Y, and Z and that your life was played out in a certain way. And now as we gay men come back to examine their life and say, who am I? What, how will my life unfold in a new openness at younger ages than certainly many of us here were able to do that so openly. That is changing, that value discussion is changing about how do we form intimate, bonded relationships, both sexual relationships and partnerships and friendships in a, in a very different way. And I think the same is true for lesbians. We were taught as women that, you know, we are nesters and homemakers. That's the image. And that's what we tried first. How natural. And then we have an awakening that says, well, that was what I was taught to be as a heterosexual woman. But I'm not a heterosexual woman. I'm a lesbian, a woman who identifies and loves other women. What is our authentic call and authentic desire for intimacy? Is it only sexuality and sex? Of course not. No human being is only about sex and sexuality, which is what the sex phobics, by focusing on sex, you know, deny themselves. Well, it goes back then to our notion of how we build our families as well, because we've almost had to create our families um, the way people create, uh, you know, Mardi Gras masks. I mean, <laughs> you know, there's a bead here and a feather here and a gathering of whoever was there and whoever is the closest. They may have been a sexual partner, they may not have. They may have been and now they're no longer. Um, and we do have the most extraordinary extended family. <laughs> I think we're a great threat and that's why I think so criticized or uh, feared. Because uh, we do what they wish they could do, which is make their friends their family or that they say that they do in so many churches across the world. We're the church family. Well, it's not always a family because most families are dysfunctional in some way. And so then that gets played and acted out theologically and, uh, and emotionally within all kinds of organizational life. And that we as lesbian and gay people in our struggle to create community does that same thing. We reach out to our families and we create our families. I wonder if the word for a value that comes out of here is not the value process. Mm. Because what I hear everyone saying is that we live lives in which, um, I mean, for example, we all know that sex can be a road to intimacy or a, 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 a road around it. And, mm -hmm. and I think that there are some people for whom intimacy is a goal and some not. Mm -hmm. But what's so interesting to me is I can't think of an issue that's been raised here or relationships that I know that we have in which there isn't some talk, and I think one of the changes among gay men mm -hmm. has been the understanding that therapy is not just to cure you, it's, it suggests means of communication. And so that's the first thing. The other thing that really struck me when, when you all were talking was a value that I would assert is a real value that certainly gay men have, can choose, and that puts gay men way ahead of non-gay men. And that is, I think, that gay men now a gay man who <clears throat> is sexist or misogynist, which has often been true in the past, 
is choosing to ignore the lesson, not only of our community experience, but of the things that are done to us. Mm -hmm. Since the major reason that gay men have such a particularly low role in our society is our identification with women. Mm -hmm. Similarly, I think that at this point, gay men who choose, and lesbians who choose to be racist, have a different relation to that than the rest of the population because we all know that the grounds of our community here cuts across all the other stuff. And it seems to me that there is, I don't know if it's progressive or conservative because I think you can employ these values in various ways, but I think there is a level at which gay or lesbian self-consciousness creates an immediacy to certain kinds of values, process, anti-racism, uh, a refusal of sexism in which the political choice is deeply connected to this inner mm. feeling. Mm. I think that certainly um, there's a historical foundation for that to happen. Mm -hmm. I also think that we've not gotten there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, I think that certainly the, the potential to figure out ways, as many oppressed people do, in, and certainly in, in this community, but to figure out ways to escape your own uh, oppression mm -hmm. now as if it were personal and not political. Now, I think when you understand that it's political, then you understand that the connection between homophobia and heterosexism and racism and sexism and anti-Semitism and all of those things, you understand them. Now, I think that uh, for many of us, you know, we haven't gotten to that point yet, and that, and, and that we experience our own oppression so severely that we are preoccupied with that personal escape, and, and that leaves us vulnerable to perpetuate issues around racism and sexism and, and all those yeah. other things. I no, remember I when we did a, a celebration of the, uh, uh, of the Bill of Rights. It was the anniversary of the Bill of Rights, and there was a panel of lawyers uh, from the community you talking Tony about... You Morrison. Yes, and I was... Um, I quoted Tony, uh, Tony Morrissey's book, but the most, the most um, strange thing I think that happened at that gathering was that after all of our panel presentations were over, uh, we had questions from the audience and a young man, white man, stood up in the audience and at the mic, uh, yes, <clears throat> and he said, well, you know, I understand why people would not like people of color or women, but why us? And this panel of very verbal, very vocal lawyers looked at this guy like, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I was the moderator, so I said, of course, anybody want to take that question? <laughs> we were just flabbergasted, but it's just what you're talking about, Phil, that we don't recognize. You know, a lot of abused people don't. I mean, the work that I've done with battered women, um, often they think that they can stop the battering if they just are better, if they just are just good. And it doesn't happen. And they don't understand that kind of violence as a tool. It's, a, it, it's, it's political. It's not about them personally. It's a whole uh, epidemic, really, in society. But I also, I also think that some of the things that Phil's articulated for us in terms of how it, we're not there yet uh, calls, calls out to those of us, the four of us sitting here, and, and to your viewers to talk about thinking about and living our values, um, that when we are conscious of that, that, that issues and the connections between racism and homophobia and sexism and ageism and anti-Semitism, uh, is that we then, we, we have to be called in some way by ourselves, by our responsibility, which is where we haven't talked much about, but which also goes, I think, with values, ethics, and morality, uh, is the issues of responsibility and personal responsibility is that we also have to then live it. And one of the things that I think that our community uh, needs to maybe shift its, begin to shift its thinking is not only to start this intellectual discussion, but that we have to help each other live it. Just as you can't learn to uh, move away from an abusive family by yourself, you, you, you might have the gut, the instinct is that I've got to get away. but. You need help there, you need compassion, you need friends, you need other people, you need a therapist to help you <laughs> move yourself 
to have a safe place to do that. And, and I think that we as a community have to also help one another, uh, whether it's through workshops or, or more discussions or among our friendship and family circles, to really start to live those ethics well, and to speak out about them. Each community probably has an ethic. And maybe many of the communities have an ethic of care. Mm -hmm. I know yes. the African American community does. I know the Jewish yes. community does. I know that in many ways, all um, ethnic communities uh, do or strive to. The, the unique thing to me about our community is that we're so atomized that we can't start from that place where we grow up, mm -hmm. or we don't, as you said, Phil. We have to somehow collect sort of the diaspora of mm -hmm. our community. Mm -hmm. We have to collect each other and ourselves back in yes. to even see that there's such a thing. And then out of that, we, we do this. And sometimes the doorway, it's sort of backwards. The doorway is the ethic of care. I am so moved because my neighbor has AIDS. I will just go be with him. Now I meet his partner, or I meet his ex-partner, who's now no, you know, back you in his life caring for him, or I meet his um, other people in his community, or I meet the rabbi when she comes over to visit him. And I'm, little by little, I learn out of my own you know, reaching out to one person that uh, there's a whole community there to join. But it feels like sort of an inversion. Instead of being born into a community, right. you have to find it and sort of join it. But isn't that part of the great joy of being part of a group? I mean, that really, uh, we are, the movement, this kind of discussion is historically unprecedented. I mean, it, there are other examples of the accommodation of sexual minority or diversity, but this particular one is new. And so it seems to me that we are doing in every one of us in our different ways through living or through talking that work and that the work we're talking about today is exactly what you say moving from the individual with whom it happens to the needs of that individual as she grows and that in fact for many of us and I think this does come with maturity the need for a community that is not merely affirming that is not merely broadly caretaking and not merely sexual marketplace mm -hmm. but a community that respects and kind of builds the things that you sort of know as you go on in life are really important. Responsibility, for example, is something, I, I, I don't mean to ask the questions, but I would profit greatly from hearing people talk a little bit about that because it's a word that is so meaningful and yet I'm a little confused sometimes about how it does operate as a value, particularly in our lives, um, is, if it's okay to ask. It's always okay to okay. ask. We've got, you know, it's so sort of like, me, we've got 60 minutes, let's talk. I, <laughs> you know, I think when I think about, again, our gay lesbian history, um, a, a, the, the little work that's been done, um, is that so much of who we were uh, in the late 60s was a rejection of that model of responsibility. I have also think we've learned uh, out of uh, the AIDS crisis out of dealing with our uh, the, the economic deprivation in the lesbian community very often because the uh, the dollar doesn't go as far in a, a woman's paycheck as it does in a man's paycheck of of learning to be responsible for one another uh, uh, and it goes back to this ethic of caring that we've had to say I'm gonna go and help my ex-lover die peacefully um, and that there's been a sense of bonding and responsibility that's gone beyond my perhaps traditional family structures. Um, but I also think that as society at large uh, takes less and less responsibility for their children, for their parents, for their family, for their friends, we don't escape that either because we're still part of the superculture. And so I think we have a responsibility to begin to think about what does responsibility mean in, in our lives as lesbian and gay people, and what does it mean to say, as part of this larger culture, I'm going to be responsible for my own ethics, actions, and values lived. Because overriding superculture wants to say that, well, you're not really responsible. It's because you have this gene, or your father was an alcoholic, you're a child of an alcoholic, or you're this, or you're that. That's the reason the, that you are the way you are. Well, but there's a difference about victim between victim status, which I've heard a lot mm -hmm. about, like we're just mm -hmm. whining, you know, and and a recognition of what oppression really does yeah. um, do 
to not only a person, but to a collection of people who are oppressed on the same basis or bases. Mm -hmm. um, when you founded the uh, Black Gay and Lesbian Leadership Forum, it was, uh, there was such an outpouring of joy of people sort of finding each other and being there. And it was a shared experience of a double victimness, but it wasn't about, you know, whining. It was about power or empowerment. And in fact, it was about responsibility. <laughs> now, it was very much about responsibility. The truth of the matter is that um, whether we know it or not, that when anyone is unable to maximize their potential, then we're all diminished by that. We lose something by that. You know, that the fact that Denise can be all that she can be, I benefit by that. And so when we founded, for example, the Black Gay and Lesbian Leadership Forum, we understood that the gay community was not able to live up to its potential because those of us who are African American were not able to live up to our t potential in that community. And that the African American community was being diminished because those of us who were gays and lesbians you know, were distracted from the contributions that we could make and had a responsibility to make to deal with the issues impacting that community. And I think that when you talk about responsibility, that is something that we all need to pay attention to. And that is the connectedness that we have to each other. And that we share a rather small planet. You know, and that we have to all participate in the survival of that planet. And quite frankly, that means an investment in each of the individuals that, that, that do that. And if I can take a second, now I would submit to you that you know, if you look at the way you do your job in the assembly, under, with, with uh, understanding the legacy of being a woman and being you know, a lesbian, compared to some of your colleagues you know, who don't understand the issues around sexism or racism or homophobia, that you know, the outcome of the work is very different and the process that you go through is very, very different. You know? And I think that manifests itself in that you take on issues that are much broader than gay or lesbian issues. You take on issues that are much broader than just the geographic region of your district you know, because you understand the connectedness. And I believe that understanding has grown out of the, 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 the experience that you've had. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, uh, when I first started teaching, I think it was the first time I really began to feel that I was a really effective teacher and, that's, and the reason stunned me. It was because I actually loved my students. <laughs> I mean, yes. I felt so fond of that group of very, I mean, they're law students. We're not talking the most <laughs> lovable people in the universe. And I just felt so fond of them. They were, they wanted to learn the, the vast majesty of the law. You know, maybe they didn't. Maybe they wanted to make a lot of money. Maybe I made it all up. But I feel in many ways the same way about groups of people that I see in the state for whom we're now responsible. All the school children of yes. the state who are suffering in so many different ways. You know, talk mm -hmm. about oppressed classes. Children, I yes. mean, they don't even speak. Have I had a child on my show to speak? No. And yet, they die in greater numbers than, you know, percentage-wise than any other community. Um, and so I feel this vast fondness. But the place that it really came from was um, coming out and allowing, as you said, Robert, and each of you has said in your own way, allowing fully the feelings that I had that were very deep human feelings of love that could never be expressed. They just not, could not be expressed. And it's not about one person. It feels like you can't really love yourself or another person fully until you let it, you know, sort of open up. And that's been a, an experience that I've seen people in our community have over and over. They're so surprised. They think coming out is going to be horrible. They think everyone will hate them. They think their parents will hate them. And they're always stunned by what they didn't expect to find, which is a very loving, warm and embracing community. Yeah, political infighting. Yeah, all the stuff that you could say. But somehow there's something in it where the opposition defines themselves by who they hate, right. and we're defined by who we love. I mean, think about it. Even yes. by them. It's a, it's a wonderful sort of pedestal, I think, for us. Uh, I don't know if that feels um, sort of authentic, like what you were saying. I, I think that it, it, it's, for me anyway, it's exactly right. Um,
from, I think the odd, you know, typically pedantic <laughs> moment was when I realized that Thomas Jefferson, one of my great academic subjects, also loved to decorate. <laughs> and somehow, I know it sounds silly, but somehow it was a moment of power because I was able to be who I was as well as this structured scholar in my encounters. And when you say that about coming out, I owe, I, I, I began to live when I came out. And I owe my life, you know, there's a temptation, particularly if you're writing and all of this, to say, oh, well, the people who founded it, they weren't. They were sort of eccentric. I glory in their weirdness and eccentricity because they and the people who are activists today gave me more than anybody else. And I think it's the gift that you get almost when you come out that is, I wonder if there's a name for that value. I somehow think it is the value of feeling blessed. And I know that sort of sounds fancy, but I think what it means is to feel at last good fortune and pleasure in, in what you're given when you start out. Well, of course, with one minute left in our show, oh, I can't imagine how fast this has gone. We haven't talked about activism and the sort of the ethics and values of giving back, of organizing, of trying to leave a legacy for others. Um, I mean, there's so many, of course, different aspects of this we could we could have talked about. But I'm I'm really delighted that uh, that the three of you were here: Phil Wilson, Rabbi Denise Eger, Robert Davidoff. I hope that this will just trigger a beginning of a discussion in your own homes, in your own offices, and on the beach for those of you who live in California um, about these issues, because this this is what we say back to them. Get used to it. Thanks for being with us.